Hello, my name is Brian Whittingham and I'm the current Renfrewshire Tannehill Macar and I'd like to welcome you to this Renfrewshire Libraries event where we're exploring for National Poetry Day the theme of vision with the subtitle To See It Like a Poet where we explore various points of view of poets looking at the world around them and to this end I'd like to welcome Sheila Templeton, Leslie Benze, and Maggie Rabatsky, whom you'll hear from in subsequent videos. Each poet will give you their take on vision. You're in for a rare treat, let me tell you. They are three writers whose work I greatly admire. However, first you've got me. Oh, you've also got Theo Van Gogh. Theo was Vincent's brother and he helped him a lot on his, his, road, his road to discovering himself as an artist. And sometimes we all need a little help in life, don't we? Whether we're artists or otherwise, some support really does, really does do us a lot of good. So, writing poetry. First thing I'm going to do is read a little section from this book here, The Poet's Home Repair Manual, written by Ted Couser. Ted Couser is an American poet, very good poet. But in his book, he touches upon something that is a recurring theme with poetry, I would suggest. Um, and he, he quotes a poem by a Jared Carter. And what he does say is, a poem can alter the way a person sees the world which is a pretty powerful statement, but I do believe it to be true. A poem can alter the way a person sees the world. So I'm going to read the beginning of Jared Carter's poem. It's called Fire Burning in a 55 Gallon Drum. And this is the first verse. Next time you'll notice them on your way to work or when you drive by that place near the river where the stockyard used to stand, where everything is gone now. And what Kuzer says is, for me, those first five words are amongst the most important in the poem. Next time, you'll notice them. Carter suggests that it's likely the reader of the poem will never again pass a group of men warming themselves at a barrel of fire without a sense of heightened awareness. We are thus indelibly marked by the poems we read. And the more poems we read, the deeper is our knowledge of the world. That's a key statement. We are indelibly marked by the poems we read. Or the song lyrics we hear can take many forms. And the more poems we read, and the more song lyrics we pay attention to, the deeper is our knowledge of the world, and ourselves perhaps. So that's from Ted Kuzer. And moving on, I'm now going to read a little quote from this Norman McCaig book. The book's titled The Many Days, Selected Poems of Norman McCaig. And if you wish to get into poetry, you could do a lot worse than open up a Norman McCaig book. He will engage your intellect, your imagination and your emotions. Now Roderick Wilson, who wrote a foreword for the book, he said, I cannot think of any other poet anywhere who has so faithfully and so persistently explored the art of noticing and the nature of being in the world. So we come back to that word, notice. An artist must notice things. Then perhaps interpret them the way they interpret them. However, whatever their perception is, is triggered by noticing. An artist must explore the act of noticing and the nature of being in the world. So, that's a lot about food for thought. Um, 
And you've got these three great writers in future videos. However, first you've got me. And I'm going to read two poems and give you my background thoughts regarding these two poems. Thank you. Okay. So that's poems called Catching Memories. And the way it came about was one day I went for a walk along beside Castle Semple Loch, which is on the road to Loch Winnock. In Castle Semple Loch, all sorts of things going on. People walking in groups, families, people going fishing, people sailing, people walking in solitude, looking for a bit of headspace, people walking their dogs, very popular for that. All sorts of things. So it's a good way to study peopleology study life. Also, can be a bracing walk, enjoyable. Plenty of fresh air, all that malarkey. So, I, I had this walk one day, and then perhaps, well, I don't know, a week later, I wrote this poem. Now, I never went out and said, I'm going to write a poem today. Time is irrelevant between the event and the actual writing. When I started writing, I initially wrote about the shipyards that I worked in as a young man, but I wrote about them 20 years after I had worked there. So sometimes you can wait a long time for an idea to germinate, or other times you can't go home quick enough to write down your thoughts regarding something. There's no hard set rules for us, everyone's different. Just do your own thing. That's the main, do your own thing. And what I've tried to do in here, as usual, is take the reader on the walk, I hope, and get over some of the ethos that I felt about Castle Semple Law. But also about how when you're out with your children and you go for a, an event, whatever it might be, uh, you don't, they, they don't particularly enjoy it perhaps on the surface. They are uh, a bit bored, a wee bit apprehensive, whatever. Impatient to get there, impatient to get home again. However, the adults seem to savour it more. But as the years go on, the children remember it. And it becomes more meaningful to them, perhaps. And amongst other stuff going on in their life. So memories sometimes, I think, mature as the years go on. That's just me. Who knows? Anyway, this poem's titled Catching Memories. In Castle Semple Loch, a father spins dreams of pike or perch. Lobs lures that glint plop into silvery sunlit sliver bobbing on the crests of afternoon ripples. Memories will be his catch of the day, of his little boy's first casting of his first line, of his showing mild interest as he munches on a banana. Washed over by his dad, who is decked out with baseball cap, peeked to the back in camouflage waders, immersed in water to his knees, with landing net at the ready. His tackle box nearby, with spare line, lures, bobbers, swivels, Leaders, sinkers, hooks, needle nose pliers, and stories of the ones that got away. As the wife unwraps an appreciative smile and a sandwich or two, patiently pouring warming mugs of tea from her flask. A dinghy tax, its sail heading horizontal, whilst unknown sailors lean in the opposite direction, their backs almost touching the water. The father, the son, the wife, and the castle simple loch. Thank you. Hello. Today, on behalf of Renfrewshire Libraries, I'd like to welcome Sheila Templeton to share some of her insights and her take on the National Poetry Day's theme 
of vision. Sheila writes in Scots and English. She grew up in Aberdeenshire, so Scots is north-east or Doric. Though she now lives in Glasgow, she's a winner of a variety of competitions, worked with children, adults, had books published, and done a variety of things. Very supportive member of the Scottish writing community and further afield. She's a pleasure to listen to. Beautiful reading voice. And she reads at just a pace that lets you savour the words. If you're interested in Sheila's poetry, her most recent collection is called Gathering and it's published by Red Squirrel Press. So I'd just like to welcome Sheila Templeton. Hello, I'm Sheila Templeton. Thank you for inviting me to read in Paisley Library here on National Poetry Day. Um, sorry, we can't be here in person, but that's just the way it is. This year's theme for National Poetry Day is vision. And um, the vision that I'm thinking about in the poems I'm going to read is really the vision of looking backwards into childhood. Both of these poems are about a time in my life when we went to live right by the side of the railway line um, on Ranach Moor, about a mile south of Karaur Junction. My dad was in charge of a group of maintenance workers on the railway line. So both of these poems are from that time, starting with childhood memories and then sort of going somewhere slightly different. I guess that's that's the vision that a, a poem takes, that's its direction. This first poem is called Gaps, so it's about gaps in memory. Um, we all, none of our memories are exactly without gaps. Gaps, a creased photograph, black and white. I'm scowling through tangled hair, my knees soft buckled, boneless, the way small children stand, holding my little brother's hand. He's oblivious to the scolding we've had, his lint white head bent in contemplation of whatever small life trembles on the bell heather springing round our sandaled feet. I asked him, seventy years on, what he remembers. A thick white cup, stamped British rail, no handle, swimming in that bright green sphagnum moss. No memory of that first winter, deer leaping the seven foot snow fence against a backdrop of mountains. Daddy saving you from the train, Prince Charlie's glass and Fort William. The gap between being two and being four. And Mammy, weeping, crouched on a cold slate doorstep as blue-white milk pooled under her knees, broken glass glinting like sudden frost. No more milk. It's midwinter, the train only once a day. My four-year-old voice they attempt to mend, to mop up this puddle of despair. My party piece for visitors, much admired. I know everyone, I know their names. Ben Nalap, Karndarg, Ben Dorin, Buchalate of Moor, the Black Mouth. And look, it's clear, we can see Shehalian. Not understanding how that couldn't help, how the diddle of the burn was no company, the daylight swallowed by the grab of the dark. So my vision, my, my direction there with that poem was about going back into childhood memory and seeing <clears throat> where it would take me. I don't think I ever thought when I was three or four years old why my mother was crying. Um, but now as an adult looking back, 
thinking of a young woman taken to live in a really quite desolate and certainly incredibly lonely place must have been very difficult. Here's another poem from that time, uh, a more cheerful poem, really all about a small girl being astonished at how much her father knew, how he seemed to know absolutely the answer to everything. Priming the pump. It's squatted by the railway fence round our garden, as if heaved up from iron roots, sturdy, pot-bellied shape, curved spout, long handle. Cart up and doon, gie it eye you've got. And I stretched my four-year-old arms to the sky, jumped, hung on, yanked, pulled, up and down. Nothing. No arc of clear water. No gush of sparkles. Until my father poured a cup of water into its ready mouth. Gee it another go. And this time, and maybe he helped too, water stuttered, then flowed, stream upon stream, filling the two white enamel pails and the big jugs, our water supply for the day. Magic, clear magic, just like the filler which never filled each evening as darkness dropped, guiding paraffin into fat brass lamps. He never told me it was called a funnel, my father. This God who caused water to flow upwards, paraffin to disappear into gluggy mystery. This lang chill who daily strode the heather miles of railway track, checking for worn fish plates, loose bolts, splintered sleepers. Who could stop an entire train with only two detonators? Yes, bring its mighty steam rush to a hissing, grinding, fire-belching halt in any emergency. Or even when we just needed milk. Thank you. Hello. Today, on behalf of Renfrewshire Libraries, I'd like to welcome Leslie Benzie to share some of her insights and her take on National Poetry Day's theme of vision. Leslie Benzie originally hails from Aberdeen. She's lived in Glasgow for 25 plus years, working and raising a family. Leslie says initially her Aberdonian vernacular was a novelty and impetus for her writing. Following publications in two anthologies, she was awarded a Scottish Arts Council bursary. From then, over the years, her writing has come on leaps and bounds. Since her work featured initially, she's had published stuff published in various magazines, done many public readings all over the world, and in 2000, after a publication of her first poetry collection, Sewing Up, She's latterly had her latest collection published titled Fessin, and this comes from Seahorse Publications, a vibrant new publisher that's on the scene. So, I'd like to say, welcome Leslie. Hi, my name is Leslie Benzie, um, and I'm a poet. Um, I was born and brought up in Aberdeen, so some of my poetry I write in Aberdonian Doric. Um, and, but I also uh, have lived in Glasgow for many decades, and so some of my poetry is also in English. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of vision in my writing. Um, obviously, as a poet, you are very much writing about everything you see around you. Um, that might be nature, it might be people, it might be um, international events, um, political events, 
Um, but you're also talking about how you particularly see the world. Um, so poems rely on, to some extent, um, good images, uh, the detail of what you see, but you're not just writing to um, demonstrate what you're seeing, you're writing to evoke uh, a sense of the meaning of what you're seeing, what you feel. Um, you're writing, sometimes you're writing about what you see to question the motives of um, the people who might be um, behind certain act, certain political behaviours. Um, and as well as relying on your vision in terms of images, you're looking at words um, from a very particular perspective so that you can choose the language that you think best portrays what you're trying to say, that evokes the, the sort of sense of a moment, that evokes all of your senses in terms of what you're trying to evoke in the reader. Um, and I guess a lot of the time your, your vision and the way you look at the world and, and the way you feel about the world is also portrayed through the language, but also the images and the similes and the metaphors that you choose to um, express, whether it's feelings or thoughts. Um, I've selected some quotes, I think, that for me reflect something really good about how to express what the purpose of poetry is and, and you know, defines it to some degree. Um, and I've chosen poems of mine to read today that I think um, go along with these quotes to some extent. Um, so I'm going to share some of those quotes with you before I then read my poems. Um, hopefully if I share the screen it's going to work. So bear with me. Okay, so I've chosen five quotes, although I'm only going to do four poems, and that's mainly because of the time factor here. But this first quote is, is, is poetry is the lifeblood of rebellion, revolution, and the raising of consciousness. And that is a quote that I can really relate to. Um, it's uh, by Alice Walker, an American novelist, um, poet, and social activist. Um, and some people sometimes uh, think of poetry that's um, about rhyming and it's all about beautiful uh, landscapes and um, flowers and, and that might be true of some poems but for me uh, poetry has um, the power to help people to see things more clearly and evoke certain feelings and that quote rings true. Um, the first poem that I'm going to share with you is, is called Fessen in the Vernacular and Fessen is the Doric word for reared in the vernacular and that's because I was born and brought up very much um, into a working class family who spoke broad Aberdonian. But the poem itself um, I think is, is quite well defined by W.H. Uh, Auden's quote, which is, poetry might be defined as the clear expression of mixed feelings. Um, I think that's a wonderful quote, and um, quite often poems do um, have a mixture of feelings, sometimes conflicting feelings, that are embedded in the poem, and actually the best way to resolve those feelings is through a poem. The next one is poetry is language at its most distilled and most powerful. So sometimes you're looking very carefully at every word you write in order to say the most but with the least words um, and that sometimes might rely heavily on one or two visual images. Um, and then the next quote is a good poem is a contribution to reality the world is never the same once a good poem has been added to it. A good poem helps to change the shape of the universe, helps to extend everyone's knowledge of, well, I'm, I'm going to say themselves and the world around them. 
And that was Dylan Thomas's quote, a Welsh poet. And this is a really beautiful quote, I think. Poetry and beauty are always about making peace. When you read something beautiful, you find coexistence. It breaks down walls. Um, and that was by Mahmoud Darwish. Um, he is a, he was regarded as a Palestinian national poet. And it's a wonderful quote from him, given precisely the situation of the Palestinians um, uh, at the moment and, and for, for what has been for a long time. But I think what he's trying to say is if you find something beautiful um, you, that you can relate to, um, even if in, in, in intellectual terms you don't agree with that person, if you can relate to that, you can find it beautiful, it does break down walls, it means you're more open to what that person has to say, which is a lovely quote about poetry, I think. So um, I'm going to start off with um, my poem that I mentioned earlier, which is called Fessin in the Vernacular. Um, and first of all, I'm going to try and get myself back to full screen. Oh, I have to stop screen sharing first and that will work. Sorry about that. So, Fessin in the Vernacular. At times life can be a North Sea wave, bracken o'er me, cold and hard like a fist, I'm not quick enough to sidestep. Like lost loves, it tacks my breath awa, and I'm soaked through, unable to cling to the parts of me, me shaped by the harshness. At others, I'm a dreich island landscape, shot through with the strength of slate grey dense volcanic rock, the dark violet sky circling our heat. The day I took you past the fitty bar, my dad's favourite, where my family congregated to bid him his last. There's Eno them wide blue skies, turning the sea a deep blue green like his een. You mock my accent that shifts back and forth from Glasgow, my spiritual home, and back to Aberdeen, like the wee waves lapping at our tees. Despite the charged sea life smell, just the same the salt smirks her kisses, and I'm grateful for it all, and that ancient ability to think for my heart. So that's a poem, I guess, that has a lot of mixed feelings in it and hopefully it's been reasonably well expressed. Um, this next poem is, um, I suppose, for me, um, encapsulates the idea of using visual images, but in the visual images you're trying to reflect um, a series of emo emotions. Um, and this is just from uh, me being in a, a, a small garden at a friend's house. And it's called Dwarf Pear. The tiny bare bosk pear drops from the tree landing effortlessly on the white wrought iron table. Smooth plump bottom caught in the crisscross of the lattice work, narrowing at its waist and to its slender neck, topped by a pert stalk reaching to find its place in the world. Its blush of russet freckles and golden colour heightened against the white weave, connecting the lattice table to the plants and pear trees here in this walled garden, breathing out their oxygen, me breathing it in, capturing the moment of beauty for the times when I can only put one foot in front of the other and need to remember there is still life. Um, so I hope that kind of reflects well on, on, on some of the visuals and the details and the, and the visual images um, that I guess are important for reflecting the world in poems. Um, this next poem is um, literally almost a, a kind of <laughs> wording of something that I observed when I was on a beach in um, a, last summer um, and it's called Still the World Turns. 
He danders for the azure blue sea to his place on the beach. He smooths his blonde designer hairstyle back to make sure it's as sharp wheat as it is dry. He tucks the edges of his fluorescent green shorts up into the inner netting to keep his manhood dressed on the right side of propriety while revealing an extra length of thigh. He finds the right angle for the sun to shine on him as so he can drip himself dry, turning a run and a run and a run like meat on a spit while he examines Ilky Inch to ensure he's br bruning to perfection. He strokes his abdomen for the flesh joins the bones or the hips, lingering at the hollows, shaped like an inverted cello's F-holes, as he slips his fingertips just inside his waistband, while his wife sits in the shade, tending to their wee daughter. When, he find, when he's finally ready to bask, he muscles in and through a masking, she applies sun lotion to his back. He checks his own reflection in his mirrored sunglasses before placing them on his upturned nose, then stretches out on the tool draped across his lounger, putting his hands ahead his head so as much of him is exposed to the world that he fancies revolves around him. Um, so my final poem, I think, reflects um, Alice Walker's quote about um, it being about rebellion and politics and revolution. And the final poem um, is a poem called Burning Bush. And it's a poem I wrote uh, um, and uh, at the latest, as, a, as a, I guess as a reaction to the latest massive um, fires, bushfires in Australia, and folk might ask why Australia, but I spent, I, I spent a couple of times there, one for five months, so I feel a real sort of um, affection for the places that I, I visited and stayed at when I was there. So this is called Burning Bush. In its two largest cities, the inhabitants choke as if they all have a 30-a-day habit, and the reed-hot glow igniting the sky can still be seen through the plumes of thick smoke for millions of acres of burning bush. But there's near a voice for God instructing him to lead his people to safety. Instead, for his sunbed in Hawaii, he evokes the sacred Aussie spirit that has enabled them to endure through calamity and bushfires such as these afore, while he tries to pour water on the evidence that there has never been bushfires such as these, and, and denies the blueprint for land management died in the bones of the country's first people, fabrocked fire for the centre of the earth, for our humans were cast in black, reed, yala, and fight in harmony with nature. And despite smallpox and cruelty like they had never seen, have preserved their cultural fires in sand lines and wackaboots that began 60,000 years ago in the dream time. As if half asleep, he repeats, now is not the time to talk about climate change. For the kingmakers of coal whisper in his dreams about the billions of reasons that he needs to put his country's economy and jobs first. An ally himself, we are them for allege that it's a conspiracy theory concocted by the loony urban elites, that we are all in the same arc of this universe. As each national leader competes for their country to be first, to consume are the earth's finite resources, to fuel the lifestyle to which the god of free trade says they are entitled, while a source of year run renewable energy beats doing in their heads, empty o conscience. For this time, it's only a few tens of folk that have died, and tens of hundreds of hames that have burned, their atmosphere stinging with the singed flesh and fur o reed kangaroos, emus, and koalas, which are among the billion animals fried in the scorched trees that money does not grow on.
So thanks very much for listening to me. Um, these were poems that um, are in my latest collection of poetry called Fessen. Um, I hope that you've found something of meaning for yourselves in them. Um, and uh, just like to say goodbye and stay safe. Hello. Today, on behalf of Renfrewshire Libraries, I'd like to welcome Maggie Robatsky to share some of her insights and her take on National Poetry Day's theme of vision. Maggie Robatsky is originally from Harris, but long resident in Glasgow. She's had two poetry pamphlets published, Down From The Dance and Holding, both published by New Voices Press. More recently, she worked with other poets in two collections of poems in Scots, Gaelic and English, published by Tapostere Press. She's been a marker of the Federation of Writers and been involved in a variety of readings. She's a very popular reader, although she's very quiet until you hear her poetry. So please sit back and enjoy the lovely tones and the wise words of Maggie Rabatsky. Hello. I'm going to read two poems and I've chosen two that I hope are a fitting for the theme of vision. The, I wrote the first poem about 10 years ago and it's a poem that uh, I wrote in response to John Lavery's painting of Anna Pavlova, the ballet dancer that hangs down in, in Kevin Grove Art Galleries. The galleries are quite near to me, just a few, few minutes down the road and as Anna Pavlova is a favourite painting of mine, that's quite lucky as I can go and visit it any time I feel like it. Uh, I like everything about this painting, uh, the colours and the way Lavery has used them to, to make, the dancer, uh, make the dancer appear translucent, which of course in turn helps to create movement and energy in the painting. I think though that what I like best about the painting is the emotion, eh, the way the dancer seems totally lost in, in the ecstasy of her performance and is oblivious to everything else except the music and the dance. That's my vision of it anyway. I, eh, I think it's quite hard to believe that this painting was painted entirely with Pavlova posing in the stud in lovely studio because it's it's so dynamic. So here it is. Anna Pavlova Thoughts on the Painting by John Lavery. <clears throat> she dances only for herself, knows nothing of the presence of others, although their eyes freeze on her. She mocks gravity in chiffon and organdy. Light as a flame, she arches to a white ecstasy where no one can follow. Only music moves in her head, an audience made motionless. Afterwards, they will bring white gardenias Five red roses in iced water. She will thank them correctly, but she will not be down from the dance. My second poem eh, was also sparked off by a picture, eh, an old photograph in fact, but it's a picture eh, in my mind as well, a memory, a very clear memory from childhood. The poem is set, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the poem is set in Pabi, which is an island in the Sound of Harris. It's, an unhab un it's uninhabited now, except for sheep and deer, but it had a population of over three, 300 in the mid-1800s. 
As a child, I used to tag along with my father and my uncles when they were going to the island to work with sheep. Shearing day is the one that really sticks in my memory. For the men, it was a long, hard slog, shearing sheep by, by hand in those days. But for me, it was a, a nice boat trip, a day on the beach and a paddle in the sea, and a chance to listen and watch things and take it all in, which I was quite good at. After the shearing, Pabby. The last kettle of the day, not hurried exactly, but with an eye to the tide. Nobody is saying much. It's been a long haul, wrestling with cheviots in the sun, and these are men who let words ripen inside before offering them up. Looks like Ms. Alec is rolling a cigarette, not easy with a tremor in his shearing hand. And there's Kanyakanyoni, lean and true as his own shepherd's crook, watching the sheep stream away from the fank past the ancient burial stones of Chambovura. Any minute now, my father will empty his cup with a flick of the wrist, throw a crust to the dogs, a sign to start moving down to the boat. Time to give the island back to its sheep and its deer, to the fretting seabirds. Time to let shadows slide back into their own spaces. Thank you.